in the last class uh, we discussed about uh, vibration transducers and uh, with uh, the understanding of in particular the piezoelectric accelerometers in this class we will see how in different practical scenarios vibration measurements are done actually using uh, piezoelectric accelerometers and how do we actually monitor the vibrations of a machine uh, be it uh, over the time or be it just for uh, uh, diagnostic measurements and so on. Okay. So, uh, typically uh, when you will come across many industries you know be it uh, cement plant, steel plant, power plant etcetera. Basically, you will be coming across many rotating equipment uh, wherein whose uh, vibration has to be monitored, measured and recorded and so on. And you see here uh, this is a torsion shaft which is rotating which is supported on the uh, bearing housings and then you will see this uh, couple of uh, few cables coming out here. These are actually accelerometers which you cannot see here and then they are uh, installed just to record the vibrations level and then we can bring back this uh, recording to the lab and do the analysis from a diagnostic point of view. But uh, another very important aspect of uh, vibration monitoring is you know uh, like I had mentioned to you in the last class regarding a standard wherein the vibration uh, monitoring has to be done so that the vibration levels are not uh, above a certain permissible limit. Similarly, uh, because we are talking about vibration monitoring, I think it is important that you should also know that there are limits of vibration level for uh, human vibration level limits. There are standards to that. In particular, wherever we have uh, human operators holding on to devices which are vibrating because of their functionality. For example, one is the steering wheel of a vehicle. One may be the you know the jack hammering uh, handle. If you go to any construction site, you will see people will be using the jack hammer drill to break in concrete, etc. And they produce lot of uh, vibrations on the handle. Okay. These are certain uh, scenarios wherein uh, harmful uh, the vibration levels could be harmful and we have to be ensuring that the vibration levels are not beyond a certain level and of course, one is the machine level of course, I will not put it here another is the machine level machines. So, we had uh, had some clue as to that standard which says uh, depending on the power of the machine, what is the permissible limits of the vibration level. Similarly, for human vibration levels, there are ISO standards as to what the permissible level should be and I thought I should mention this in this class that is the ISO 2631 standard. If we look here and uh, this is the permissible le limit ISO 2631 human vibration limits subject to different frequency bands in uh, octave in one third octave till about 1000 hertz in, this in the x axis. This is the RMS values of the velocity in this curve and the RMS values of the acceleration in the in this uh, line here and for 4 to 8 hours of continuous holding on to a device what should be the permissible level is given by this. Uh, line here for 2 to 4 hours for less than half an hour. So, these are the limits as per ISO 2631 standard. So, if I have any operator holding on to a steering wheel for 4 to 8 hours, the maximum RMS level should be in this band below this level. So, these levels are there. We are not of course, you know in machinery health monitoring, we are not talking about you know how to uh, ensure that the levels are less. But I thought you should know in this class that there are also standards for human vibration levels. For example, another is the car seat vibrations, the human seat uh, your, your body is sitting on a platform. What should be the maximum allowable level of the uh, vibration to the seat and that is also there. 
okay these are for holding hands for a human body position there are different uh, levels also you can see that in the standard just as an example uh, i will uh, maybe go back to this slide first uh, and this is a tractor okay wherein uh, this uh, steering wheel was having excessive vibrations okay and uh, this relates to a uh, little bit of diagnostic uh, procedures as well so what happens uh, this level of the steering wheel was much higher than the permissible levels and as soon as the engine was starting to idle okay the vibration levels were high and you must have noticed it in many of the um particularly in diesel engines you know not not in the modern cars of course if you think of the old jeeps etc you will see as soon as the uh, engine is starting your steering column would rattle and then there will be heavy vibration levels on as per international standards are they acceptable we do not know okay are our products marketable no not because of the international standards so in this uh, particular case what has happened is the firing frequency which is generated by the engine the engine firing frequency was almost close to the steering wheel resonance okay so no matter how good a steering wheel you design in from a strength point of view from a uh, damping point of view uh, not from a damping from a mass or a stiffness point of view you will not be able to stop the motion of the steering wheel because it is vibrating at its natural frequencies which is what is the forcing frequency it is the engine firing frequencies i cannot change the engine firing frequencies because that is how my engine is designed to operate at a certain rpm it has so many cylinders it is a four stroke engine and so on so the and its idling uh, rpm is uh, fixed okay so if the uh, engine firing frequency cannot be changed all i can do is change the steering wheels resonant frequency and that is how it was done uh, using uh, the finite element methods we can design the attachment locations okay we can change it you can see this is a three spoke steering wheel as opposed to a two spoke steering wheel so just by changing the design of the steering wheel we will change the natural frequency and shift the natural frequency away from the forcing frequency so to avoid to avoid resonance condition through design we can change that okay and then we can uh, shift the natural frequency now if your engine idles the steering wheel is not going to vibrate okay so now how do we do the vibration monitoring here of course you do not see this uh, accelerometers we see the clips there are uh, locations even sometimes you can mount accelerometers on clips for, um, for example this is the plastic uh, cover on the uh, steering wheel skeleton okay as a molded plastic wherein we can put a clip on on this clip you can mount the accelerometer okay now how do we do the rot rotational speed monitoring okay and sometimes we can use the reluctance type pick uh, pickup sometimes we can use also a photo tachometer wherein of course this is a shiny surface so if you if you shoot a light beam okay 
and if there is a signy patch it is going to reflect back okay or if you can uh, in fact there are signy patches you can fix here and then uh, you can have a frequency counter. And then we can measure the rotational speed or you can record it as well. Okay. And this is, a, uh, this is out of a gear box okay. and if you will see here we have you put a you, have, you can see a shiny white element. Um, aluminum block actually it is an aluminum block wherein this is the casing of the gearbox it is not possible to tap it okay, at this site. So, all we did was put a mounting block and glued it with a cement okay. and if you will see couple of holes here one hole here and on a stud coming out on this accelerometer um, block we can either screw on the accelerometer to measure the acceleration. I will show you another view and this is across and this is how dirty or unhealthy or conditions are there in the actual industry uh, with gears everywhere and grease everywhere etcetera. I obviously cannot put and there is no space to and these are they are always rotating plant would not shut down. So, what people can we have done is uh, glued this blocks mounting blocks we just clean the surface, clean it, remove it of grease, put a cement and then it sticks almost instant glue is there and then you can put this block onto this block you can screw the accelerometer and this is the rotary kiln I was talking about in a cement plant actually okay. and this is the uh, plumber block which is used to house the uh, bull gear. And uh, this is another view wherein we can see the accelerometers. This this is a triaxial accelerometer. You'll see these three cables coming out, okay? Wherein we have put this block, okay? And then we can orient this direction to see the uh, measure the vibrations in the three directions, okay? So as I was telling you, vibrations in three directions is always very important from a diagnostics point of view. Whether we want to measure the radial vibrations or the axial vibrations at that particular location and typically in any plant you will see the configurations of uh, the machineries are a prime mover being being driven by a uh, sorry a uh, machine being driven by a prime mover this prime mover could be a electrical motor or an iso engine and this is the new iso 10816 standard which says the allowable vibration level for a particular machine and the ISO 2631 was for the human being and ISO 10816 is for the machines which says we have to measure the RMS vibration level in the frequency range from 10 hertz to 1000 hertz vibration level has to be in the velocity mode that is either in meters per second or millimeters per second and then there are three levels of vibration whether the machine is acceptable, machine is an intermediate stage or the machine's vibration is are unaccept unacceptable the machine has to be diagnosed and corrected and of course, these levels depend on the machine power and just for example, if it is a 1000 kilowatt machine this vibration in the highest vibration in any direction has to be 3 millimeters per second. Okay. And this standard only tells you about the overall vibration level and then we have to ensure whether it is acceptable, not acceptable. So, if you just have a vibration meter and an industrial accelerometer and you go around different places in your plant and just measure the vibration level itself and come up with the values that itself is a good survey to ensure that whether the machines are ok or not ok, okay if you just follow the standard and many industries definitely do that. 
but the problem which we have as a machinery fault diagnostics engineer is what is the real cause of this levels of vibration if they have exceeded and for that we need to record the vibration level do a spectral analysis find out this frequencies at which the levels are high and then try to relate why these frequencies are high you know which is the physical parameter which has been responsible for making this uh, level high and then how do we correct it okay and typically if you go to any plant this is how the configuration is So, this is the prime mover, this is the mechanical unit, and this is usually a coupling. Okay. This prime mover could be a electric motor. This could be a gearbox, could be a pump, could be a blower, could be a fan, easily. Okay, and they have to be put on a foundation. Okay. And this could be driving some other things and this is typically the configuration of the machines in 90 percent of the cases. Okay, and we have to capture the dynamics of this system that is our objective. So, what are the good places to capture the vibrations? Of course, you know we have a, a bearing here, this is the non drive and bearing. N D E. Similarly, we have the D E and this we have another D E, another non drive one. Okay, and coupling. I will mark the ideal locations of the accelerometers. Accelerometers should be kept close to this location, close to this location, close to this location, close to this location, sometimes close to the foundations. These are the typical positions of accelerometers. We should definitely avoid places like you know just put it in a because this casing is very important and you know, just to put it here. It is accessible easily accessible you just put one accelerometer here. These are not the good places. Okay. not desirable. Okay. I will uh, enlarge one of these views here and try to explain. Suppose, I have a shaft and then I have or bearing. The shaft is rotating and then shaft is put on a casing. Just one view I am drawing maybe.
this is some machine component and this is our uh, shaft see the these are not good locations to keep your bearings uh, to put the accelerometers because they are far away from the dynamics of the system okay the best location would be you know maybe this is a good location this is another good location okay we are as close to the bearing as possible okay sometimes you now this may be too thin so we should try to go for a thicker system wherein the dynamics is captured okay in a system there is no if this extend like this there's no these are not good locations to put accelerometers so we have to be accelerometer has to be mounted close to the generation of the vibration because this shaft if it was a missile and etc the forces should come at the supports at the bearings and this is where a lot of motion will be there if i measure here they'll have very poor signal to noise ratio i may get something but they'll be buried with a lot of noise okay so you have to be very close to the generation of vibration and that is how when you you need do an initial survey of a machine for doing vibration monitoring you have to ensure try to find out where the bearings are located where the um, rotors are ro located in a motor okay where are where are the um, loose uh, foundations okay where are the impact forces being generated etc so these are the places which we put uh, the vibrations not on a you know, flashy control panel you no know, a lot of meters there you just put an accelerometer there no definitely not okay these are places where we should not put the accelerometers okay so this is with this in mind uh, i'll show you uh, another case wherein uh, we have actually a typical uh, case motor gearbox uh, this is the top view okay and uh, there are so many different locations wherein you know the vibrations were monitored if you see the black ones they are the bearing locations this is uh, uh 13 is the non drive end bearing 16 is the drive end bearing and this is a three stage gearbox okay so there are shafts like this intermediate shaft input shaft output shaft so the shafts are supported on bearings 2 and 7 3 and 8 4 and 9 and then this is the the bevel gear okay so there's a power shaft here so there's another bearing here and on top of it every foundations of this motor four foundation gearbox four foundations they are uh, measured and just for comparison another, another point outside the system is measured just to ensure how high or how low the level outside are and in foundations you know depending on the configuration foundations could be of different types okay whether it's on the concrete whether there is a steel frame another structure etc and and then of course the direction is axial horizontal and vertical is coming out of the plane of this projection here so you see in all this for vibration monitoring if there are 18 locations and every locations i am having 3 so 18 into 3 channels of uh, 54 channels of vibrations are recorded so if i was to measure simultaneously i need to have a system which will take in all these recordings together but and because you know that will help you do from a diagnosis point of view if they are measured simultaneously i will return the phase information relative phase between these signals okay 
and then that will help me. But sometimes just even a single channel FFT also gives me some clue as to what the vibration levels are. And this is uh, the typical uh, arrangement wherein you will see uh, this is the coupling here and this is the gear box. Okay. And actually this gear box was used to convey um, raw materials in a, on a conveyor system. If you will see here this is the motor here and uh, uh, this is the gear box okay, in the motor. So, you will see a bevel gear arrangement wherein there is a 90 degree reduction in the uh, power transmission direction and this is driving a conveyor system and you will see these are the bearings you know if you are marked here 1, 2 etcetera they are different bearing for the intermediate shaft and they are put on a concrete platform on to which there is a steel frame on which these steel frames are normally there to ensure that the alignments are perfect between the gearbox and the motor. So, that the horizontal this shaft remains horizontal perfectly horizontal. Sometimes once we have the steel structure it is very easy to put in shims. So, that the alignment can be done and that is why and they can be all uh, manufactured in one piece and the foundation is put. So, that at site <coughs> in fact, at this location this was about you know 100 meters from the ground on, on a platform <coughs> made out of concrete and because you know the conveyors was <coughs> were coming out from large ships and they are high over the ground and obviously, there uh, because this floor if it is not on level uh, this system could be having a misalignment. So, lot goes on to ensuring that the shaft between the motor <coughs> and the gearbox are on level in the same horizontal plane even a variation of few millimeters or microns is going to affect the dynamic forces. So, perfect alignment has to be done imagine you know 100 feet or 100 meters above the ground you are doing such such, uh, such an arrangement and then how do you ensure that uh, they are all aligned and these these are provisions wherein shims can be done and to ensure that the vibration levels are less than the levels allowed as per the ISO standard we have to monitor at all these possible locations in 18 locations in this case 18 into 354 locations and see what is the highest levels and whether they qualify the standard of the version. In fact, in this case uh, we had situations where the manufacturing was so poor that the alignments were not done uh, they were uh, there were a few you know, welders you know I do not have a better view here, but you know they were lying. Uh, um, because this, this this was used to unload raw materials from the ship. So, obviously, you can imagine this that this is near a seashore and seashore the environment is very very salty uh, um, corrosive air is blowing and this system which was lying there for about 2 3 months on the monsoon and on a corrosive wind you can see lot of corrosions occurring in the foundations here corrosions on the motor base as well and this will weaken the structure on top of it if you want to uh, not do a perfect alignment a uh, lot of sources of high vibrations can arise no matter you may be having a very very good new gearbox new motor new bearings but your misalignment in the foundation this is going to give you a lot of high levels of vibrations and in fact uh, this is where the ships uh, come in uh, unload uh, coal as you know our country we do not have good quality of cooking coal, but we have good quality of iron. So, we export iron ores okay, the same conveyor systems one system is used to export iron ores onto the ship another another conveyor you know uh, takes in uh, the coal from the ship and this conveyors uh, go to large silos uh, wherein we dump the raw material and then there are uh, stackers and reclaimers who will take this uh, um, coal which we import and then put it on the wagons and they will come to the steel plants or the power plants. Okay. And in such a scenario we had uh, serious failures of you know, the conveyor systems because it was a new plant, uh, new conveyors, uh, new bearings, uh, new motors, new gearboxes 
but they did a lousy job in installation misalignment was there and then this gave rise to a lot of high forces unbalanced forces and the whole thing uh, some of the components did break okay so we need to ensure that through vibration monitoring this can be avoided okay and this can be done another uh, case of uh, vibration monitoring which is done uh, this is the case of a permanently installed uh, vibration monitoring of bearings okay particularly this is the case of a uh, paper mill okay in paper mill i don't know if you know how papers are manufactured basically there are lot of rolls okay lot of rolls rotating at different rpms could be at 1200 rpms and this paper actually uh, if i was to briefly tell you uh, this is a pulp pulp of waste paper plus maybe some fresh wood wood pulp which is made to a pulp after a chemical treatment this is like a slurry of uh, very very almost full of water okay watery slurry okay and this is fed onto a roll okay and which is spinning at high speed this rolls okay and because there is a lot of water this has to be again pressed by heavy rolls okay and then there has to be a guide wire okay and this rolls have to press against it as if you are squeezing the water out of it and there will be a lot of water getting collected okay and then there will be another another series of rolls okay wherein uh, some will be like this okay and there is a series of rolls etc they are all rotating at very very high speeds okay and this rolls e eventually they will be taking off and then finally and these are actually known as the dryer rolls okay so basically they, they are steam dried so uh, this uh, pulp is getting red and this this uh, rolls could be as wide as about 4 meters heavy rolls rotating at about 1200 rpm series of such rolls and this is another dryer rolls so basically we are drying the pulp which where the water has been squeezed off okay then we are drying it and then we have to calendar it you know, what is known as the calendaring is a kind of ironing it okay and towards the end there will be a pickup roll so if you go to any paper mill there are about maybe close to about 200 high speed rolls okay about each about 1 meter 2 meter in diameter 1 meter uh, the initially one and then they will uh, earlier uh, later on thin down and rotating uh, uh, about 200 rolls maybe 100 rolls of the size of 1 meter in diameter and then 4 meter in length rotating at high speeds and then finally eventually the paper comes out and this is a view of the dryer rolls if you can see the rolls here and of course all these rolls have to be supported on bearings and imagine if one roll breaks or fails your paper is going to get jammed and there will be no production this is a continuous process about 80 tons of paper comes out per day okay this is continuously running you know you feed in pulp all you have is a series of rolls pressing it drying it ironing it or calendaring it and then you have a pickup roll and in such a rolling mill because of the high temperatures first of all they have to run continuously and because of this high temperature there is extreme heat on the bearings of the rolls okay the roll bearings have to be monitored 
and they have to be lubricated they have to be greased okay and in such a plant the bearings have to be monitored continuously and to do that at every bearing location if you see the steel cables uh, steel ro uh, rope uh, kind of things here these are actually the cables which are coming out from the permanently installed vibration sensors at each bearing location so if there is a roll number they know the bearing number okay and in such a plant and this is in a paper mill continuously uh, the data is being recorded okay uh, this is another view of the uh, on the other side you will see this is again a transducer which is used to measure this is one of the rolls of the paper mill and you can see a lot of steam these are all steam jacket steam pipes are there to heat the dryer dryer rolls you know these are all steam pipes and very high temperatures rotating at high speeds every bearing has to be uh, monitored continuously okay and then all the signal comes to a, a monitoring station wherein uh, a person the analysis uh, uh, person could be recording it and could be analyzing it and there are uh, automated alarm levels according to that standard whether the levels are high or low they will let you know that you know uh, we need to take precautions to reduce the levels of the um, signal and so on okay and that is what is uh, done in the uh, monitoring of the bearings from the paper mills okay continuously we have to do that okay another case is the case of uh, a gas turbine if we we'll close uh, look here this is actually a gas turbine which is driving a generator no many many places they have gas turbines used to drive electric generators okay maybe in your uh, naval frigates etc which are driven by gas turbines gas turbines drive generators generators are used to drive uh, uh, motors which are used to drive propellers okay not directly coupled to the uh, gas turbines these generators are the power source of the uh, plant and of course in in the northeast of our country we have a lot of gas turbine power plants you know 20 megawatt 150 megawatt power plants driven by gas turbines you know have, all you do is a gas turbine fuel put in a gas turbine and then uh, use it so here we are monitoring uh, the gas turbine vibration levels by putting in uh, an accelerometer if you can see here this is an icp type of accelerometer wherein this gives the power supply and obviously the gas turbines are very very noisy so we have to put a ear muff here because it is a very noisy environment this was in a test bed we are monitoring the health of the uh, gas turbine to do uh, the health monitoring so in uh, uh, summary we have to while we are doing vibration monitoring couple of things we have to keep in mind one is the location okay locations always may not be accessible locations uh, so in that in that case we have to use what is known as non contacting type transducer like lasers but for permanent mount we can put industrial accelerometer by industrial i mean industrial accelerometer means the same accelerometer but very robust which can be subjected to high levels of acceleration which can be subjected to high temperatures and they can be permanently mount but for uh, vibration diagnosis and for vibration monitoring as long as i follow the iso standards i am doing good 
but for vibration diagnosis I need to record the time history either through a tape recorder or through a digital data recorder. I have to record simultaneously why do I record simultaneously to retain the phase relationship. This is very important when we are doing the diagnosis. So, as a condition machinery for diagnostics engineer, we would be more interested in recording the time history simultaneously and then so that we return the phase relationship, so that we can know the cause of vibration is important. Okay. Machines are going to give out vibration levels A, B, C machine components at their characteristic frequencies. So, this information is not available if I just look at an RMS level of the vibration level from a permanently installed transducer I will get a certain value. This only tells me whether the value is more or less than the acceptable level, but if I do a recording in the time domain do an FFT analysis, see the individual components which have come up in the spectrum and then relate these parameters F A, F B, F C to physical condition. Only then can I say whether for the high levels of vibration whether the component B is responsible or A is responsible or C responsible I can do that. For example, if I was doing vibration monitoring in this way I will be suddenly alarmed if this B was increasing I will now well at all recordings my B levels are increasing. So, something is wrong with B. This should not be possible if I had just seen the overall level overall RMS level from 10 to 1000 hertz, if I had seen the overall vibration level, I would not know whether it was B A which is responsible for such an high level or B whether it is responsible for a high level or C which is responsible for such an high level. Okay. And uh, so, what should be there in your vibration monitoring kit? Okay. In your vibration monitoring kit, we must have the transducer with its mounting accessories like magnets, uh, studs, taps, etcetera, the cables the power supplies, portable power supplies, the readout units, readout units either analog or digital. transducer to measure rotation. Sometimes a data recorder
and of course another very important thing is the handheld calibrator typically which gives 10 meters per second square at 1000 radians per second ok. And of course, we have to have a writing pad to make a sketch of the measurement. configuration as to axial, vertical, horizontal because we have to measure in axial, vertical, horizontal and this is what has to be there in any vibration monitoring kit which is used to and you can have multiple number of transducers okay, as the case may be. Okay. If you have uh, if you are carrying this equipment with you and if you understand how to do that and sometimes you know uh, another question on this calibrator is usually this at 1000 radians per second this means 159.2 hertz. So, if you look at the spectrum coming out of the calibrator you will see a peak of 10 meters per second square at 159.2 hertz. Sometimes it is good to have this field calibrator just to check the sensitivity level because you can be having uh, power supplies and uh, maybe a conditioner or a signal conditioner like the charge to voltage amplifier. And another thing which we have to do in the accelerometer calibration uh, calibrator in the lab before you go to the field to the, do the vibration mounting is do an overall calibration and this is done by this method. We have to in the uh, lab you can put an power amplifier a random <coughs> noise signal generator this is an exciter and onto this you attach an accelerometer which is a ref reference accelerometer onto which we measure the test accelerometer so if you measure the transfer function between the test accelerometer and the reference accelerometer if i know the reference accelerometer is good from a certain bandwidth you should see a plot like this whatever. So, this means the test accelerometer is behaving the same as the reference accelerometer for the all frequencies of excitation. So, this kind of calibration we cannot do in the field of course, you know this 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 uh, these two signals have to be fed to an FFT analyzer of course, Very important. Okay, and you just see the transfer function between the this accelerometer and this uh, reference accelerometer divide one by the other they should be the same and that is why you will get this one value of one. Once you are done that you can uh, uh, be sure that this accelerometer test accelerometer which you are going to take it to the field is calibrated for all frequencies and at the field you just give a known value of 10 meters per second square at 159.2 hertz and see whether they corresponds you are getting the same value or if I get some x voltage 
in the system, I know this corresponds to 10 meters per second square. Okay. This can be done. Okay. So, uh, this is very, very important and as you know, there is a uh, relationship between this 10 meters per second square at 1000 radians per second. Now, omega square a is the acceleration. So, this will boil down to 10 millimeters per second at 1000 radians per second or 10 micron of displacement because of the relationship omega a omega omega square a and omega. So, this is a handy rule and it is very easy to remember 1000. Actually, 1000 corresponds to 159.2 hertz and that you can see in any FFT analyzer. Okay. So, in summary uh, to do vibration mounting you have to be careful about the equipment which you take, how you mount the accelerometers and uh, what kind of precautions you have taken to ensure that the accelerometers are properly calibrated and what you get is uh, what you should get. Okay, Not that garbage in is garbage out. Okay, You have to ensure that you have measured correctly. Nothing like, uh, like doing a correct measurement because all your diagnosis depends on how you measure the vibration levels. Okay. Okay, thank you.